Church at West Franklin. My name's Josh Lynn. I'm the missions and connection minister here. Uh, I'm excited. I, it often seems that when I get to preach, it's to the, the combined group. Thanks, Kenny. Uh, to the combined group. Uh, so normally we have two services, but today there's a feeling that you get when we're all singing together. The room is full. And we're here to, to honor the Lord together. So thank you, like Brad said earlier, for taking your time to be with us today. We're grateful for that. We're going to open up our scripture to Psalm chapter 1. Uh, if you have a copy of the scripture, you can do that. Uh, that will also be on the screens for you if you don't. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 1 today. We're starting a new sermon series. And, and the first thing that we want to talk about is why a sermon series on Psalms right now. Uh, the first reason for that is because uh, it's personal. Uh, as a part of the Brentwood Baptist family of churches, all of our churches, all, all the campus pastors, so Matt, who's on vacation this week with his family, Matt and all the other campus pastors come together and put together the sermon series together that the church, they think, needs to hear for the upcoming year. Uh, this particular sermon series, though, is one that's out of Matt's own heart. This is specifically for West Franklin. Uh, I think Matt is the preacher that he is. He's the pastor that he is because he preaches from a place of studying you studying the congregation, knowing you. He's going to speak more to why he chose to put together uh, a, a series of five weeks on the Psalms when he's back next week. Uh, but just know that this series was put together with, with you and your seats in mind. Uh, another reason is because one of our, our church-wide goals, something that we're trying to work together on, is prayer. Uh, we want to grow in our ability to pray. We trust that if God is going to do anything in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our church, it's going to start with prayer so that who gets the glory for it? Not us, not Matt, not the people in the chairs, but God alone gets the glory for it. So we're going to pray and that, that, that God would move. And the Psalms are a collection of heartfelt pouring outs to God. It's the Psalms, uh, more than anything else in the Bible, maybe, other than Jesus telling us how to pray, teach us how to pray, how to pour ourselves out to God. And so we're going to see specific application points from the Psalms about how our prayer should be fueled, should be informed, uh, and, and those things. Uh, finally, uh, we want to prepare ourselves. So this, this sermon series on Psalms is, is for our preparation. Again, we want to prepare to see God move in our church and in our community. We think that the foundation of that is through prayer, through the, the gathering that we're doing together right now. Uh, and, and we want to prepare to see God move. But also another sermon series coming up in the fall that I'll tease for you. Uh, we're going to spend several weeks studying the life of David. And uh, David uh, is not attributed for writing the first psalm that we're in today, but more than anybody else, uh, he, he's the author of the psalms. About 70 psalms are specifically attributed to David. And so as we start preparing our hearts in the psalms, we're going to be able to look forward to studying the life of a guy who wrote almost half of them, right? So this is why we're studying the psalms. Um, I think it's going to be a fantastic series. Again, Matt will speak more to, to his thoughts, his heart on that later. Uh, when he's back in. But for now, let's just jump right into it. If you would, stand with me in honor of God's word. We're going to have Psalm 1. It'll be on the screen behind me. Psalm 1, starting in verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night, he is like a tree planted beside streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish." Father God, we come before you with your word open, uh, like a stream of water, would you let your word teach us today? Would you help me to decrease as I speak so that your son Jesus may increase uh, in these words and in this room? It's in the name of Jesus we pray these things, amen. You can be seated. I'm going to warn you ahead of time, we're going to spend the bulk of our time together in the first two verses. So there's going to come a point way down the line where I'm going to say, okay, now go to verse 3, and you're going to be panicking. 
but this is, this is intentional, okay? We're going to spend most of our time in these first two verses because I'm convinced that if we get a right understanding of what's going on in verse 1 and verse 2, then it's easier for us to unpack the rest of the, the other four verses that we have. So the, the first thing that the, this writer of the psalm wants to convey, first you should know that this psalm, uh, the psalms are a collection of psalms. Most of them are probably written, about 70 of them are probably written by David. Others, we have no idea who wrote them. But the first psalm is placed intentionally as the first psalm by a later editor who is collecting all these writings, all these prayers, all these things being poured out to God, and, and that editor selected this first psalm intentionally. It's a gateway psalm to open our hearts, to set our antennas for the rest of what Scripture has to offer, but especially the rest of what the Psalms has to offer. And so pay attention first to that first word that the author says. He says, blessed. Uh, other translations will say, happy is. Right? Blessed is. Happy is. Uh, I think blessed probably connotes more of what the, the author is trying to convey, right? You, you receive blessing. You are blessed, not you merit blessing, but you are blessed by God when you follow certain things, right? These are general practices, but, but the very first word of the Psalms is not God in, in judgment. The very first word of the Psalms are not uh, uh, you wicked sinner, listen to me. The first word of the psalms are not, you're dead in your trespasses. The first word of the psalm is not, let me get, tell you what to do. The first word of the psalm is not a starting of a list of right and wrong things to do. The first word of the psalms is blessed. It's a state of being, not a state of doing, right? You are blessed. You receive blessing by God. Blessed. It's like an antenna pointing us the right direction. Blessedness follows an objective path, though. So again, get this straight. Blessedness is not something that we're meriting by what we're doing, but there's a relationship between being blessed and following an objective path. What I mean by that is that there are two clear paths in Scripture. We live in a day and in a world where everyone says we want to make our own way. Right, Whatever's right in our eyes is what's right for us. I get to define who I am. I get to define what I think. And whatever is right for me, you can't argue with because it's right for me, not for you. Have you heard that line of thinking before? It's what our culture is. It's radical individualism. Right, The individual has risen to the highest peak of who we are. For our culture, who you are as an individual is the most important thing about you. God says that the most important thing about you are the objective truths about your heart. There's two clear paths that are set out in Psalm 1 and 2 and expanded on in the rest of the psalm. There is a path that leads to blessedness and a path that does not. There are objective things that we can observe about the world that are true and are right and are good, and we aren't the ones who get to define those. It's God who gets to define them. Truth is objective, truth is real, and God says what it is. Are the, wrapped up in the very first two verses of this psalm. The psalmist unpacks this by giving us three things that we don't do and two things that we do do if we are focusing on blessedness, right? So the blessed person doesn't do these three things. What are they? The blessed person doesn't walk. Which way? Right? He doesn't walk with wicked people. Right? The blessed person doesn't stand with sinners. And the blessed person doesn't sit with scoffers. Now, if you're reading this and trying to take this into a literal space, right, the first thing you should say is, well, Jesus definitely took walks with wicked people. Jesus definitely stood around with a bunch of sinners. And Jesus definitely sat down and ate with people who mocked who he was and what he was trying to do. Right? This is not meaning a literal don't actually engage with these people. What the psalmist is saying is don't fall into the ideologies that are here. Notice also the progression too, right? The picture is of a person who's walking, right? First he starts off walking, and the psalmist says don't walk with wicked people, right? The wickedness here is talking about an internal corruptness, right? We all have this, this fallen state. We live in a fallen world. But the first, the first call of the psalmist is not to walk in wickedness, right? Not to continue along with this, reflecting an internal state of our heart. Don't walk and follow whatever your heart is telling you to follow. 
Just because your heart says this is right for you does not mean that it's objectively good and true. My heart wants to eat an entire cake this afternoon. <laughs> My heart wants th every kind of pie on our July 4th celebration. I want a slice of each and have my own pie with seven different slices of other kinds of pie. My heart wants this. Is it good for me? We'll find out. <laughs> I will report back next week, okay? Just because our desires lead us to a place does not mean that that's a good place for us. Pull, pull that back up. I want to keep that, those, those words on the screen for a minute. This, this internal compass that you have telling you which way to go on our own is faulty, is what the psalmist is saying. But notice the, the, the man in the psalm, the, the antithetical man in the psalm, right, the, not, the unblessed person, moves from a, a position of walking to a position of standing with sinners, Right, the sinner nature of this is not only when we're following right, our own internal com compass that's corrupted, that wants us to eat an entire cake or an entire pie made of other pies. I just made that up on the spot, but it sounds fantastic. <laughs> um, I'm stuck there. The, 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 <laughs> the standing with sinner, right, he slows down, right? First he was walking, now he's slowing down and standing in the presence of sinners, uh, but what this is representing is, is a practicing of it, right? I'm already thinking about eating a whole pie, but I'm not doing it yet. But if I slow down and let my thoughts take me captive, then I'm going to slow down to the point of, hey, maybe, maybe it is a good idea, right? It's, already, it's happening to me on this stage. It's definitely happening to you. <laughs> maybe not with pie. Maybe it's something else, right? But the, the psalmist is saying, don't walk in these ways that your heart is guiding you. There's an objective right, and your heart doesn't have the, the, the equipment to find it. Don't stand in the way of sinners. Don't practice the things that are uh, corrupted in your heart, right? This is a, a step further, right? We're slowing down. Our bodies are slowing down, and we're taking a deeper step into sin, right? And finally, what is he doing? He's sitting. He's complacent with where he is. He's sitting with scoffers, which is turning from not only, not only having an internal corruptness, not only practicing that corruptness that's internal, but then going so far as to mock the holy things of God, it's the pattern that we can fall into so easily, and it's the pattern that we see in the world, isn't it? What's right for me is right for me. You can't tell me otherwise. I'm going to act out on what I feel is good for my body. I'm going to act out on what I feel is good for me. Forget you for telling me how to live my life. I get to decide that. Do you see the pattern? I wish the Bible was relevant today, as Matt Pearson would say. Right. Okay, so we, we see this, right? We see this pattern. Uh, let's look at what, what the psalmist tells us to do. What does a blessed person, what does a blessed person does? What does he does? Uh, there's two things that he does. He delights in the law and he meditates on the law. Okay? Delights in the law, meditates on the law. Right? These are active components. We're gonna unpack that a little bit in a second. But when when we're reading the word law, the better understanding, right, there's, there's an Old Testament sense of law that is also implied by the psalmist, right? He means the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. He's talking about the law there. Uh, but, but the word law is also just a general word where the psalmist is conveying God's instructions for you, God's counsel for you. And so this expands beyond those first five books. This is why the psalmist puts it at the beginning of the psalms. Is he's saying these, these things that you're about to read, 149 more of, are instruction for you. They're things for you to take delight in. Right? When we turn to the word, it should spark something in us and say, man, that thing, that book that was written thousands of years ago is relevant for me in 2023. That book that was written thousands of years ago, this poem written by an author, means something for my life today on July 2nd, 2023. And to delight in that and to hunger for it. That's what happens with a blessed man. Again, there's an active component about this, but being blessed means that you come to God's word, you come to God's counsel, and you have, find joy in it. Okay? If that's not you, don't worry. We've got some time. The second one is he meditates on it. Uh, the word for meditates here, I think there's a lot of connotations for what meditation means. Um, a, a very popular form of meditation is to try to move everything out of your mind, 
right? You're feeling anxious, you're feeling stressed, right? This, this, this very Eastern philosophy of remove everything from your mind, right? There's, in Zen Buddhism, they tell you to try to imagine, if you want to think about nothing, just try to imagine one hand clapping in your brain. Can you do that? No. That doesn't make sense, really, but okay, let's try and get rid of these things, get, clear our minds, right? I think a, a, a Western American version of trying to meditate to clear our space is to finish our to-do list, to check off everything on our bucket list, to get everything resolved so that we can have peace at the end of the day when we sit down. But does your to-do list ever get finished? If you finish your bucket list, you're adding more things to it, right? This is trying to empty yourself of your desires, of your needs, of your things that you have to do, to try to empty your brain of all the burdens that fall upon you is not what we're talking about. Instead, the type of meditation on God's counsel that's flowing out of a delight from God's counsel, the type of meditation that the psalmist is talking about is filling yourself with something. You love God's counsel so much that you want to take it into yourself. You want to think about it constantly. You want it to be turning around in your brain. The word for meditate here kind of connotes muttering. Like have you seen maybe a crazy person who just walks around saying something over and over and over and over and over and over again? I think about Sherlock Holmes. When the pieces of a puzzle are starting to come together, there's something from chapter 3, it's always chapter 3, that you haven't thought about since the beginning of chapter 3, that Sherlock Holmes, all of a sudden, he starts muttering. He says it over and over and over again. He's trying to think about it from every direction, from every side, every angle. Maybe there's something here that I haven't figured out yet, and if I just say it over and over and over and over and over again, I'm going to see it from every side. To wrap your head fully around God's counsel is what this is saying. For it to stick in your mouth, for you to not be able to, to stop thinking about it. That's what meditation is. To take God's counsel in and try to think it through in every direction you can. Meditating on his counsel is what a blessed person does. So again, I mentioned this a second ago. A, bless, a blessed person, the blessed factor has an active component to it, right? Part of it is a status that we have from God. You are blessed or you are not blessed, right? Right? But there's an active component to this. And if we think back to the, walk, or the walking, standing, sitting, uh, I think we can understand this a little bit better. Matt asked a very analytical person to start out a series on psalms. So naturally, uh, I'm going to take beautiful poetry and talk to you about physics for a second. Okay? Hold on to your horses. No, we, we got this. There's a word called entropy. All right, are, are you familiar with entropy? Entropy is... A state of the universe where everything tends to break down from more complex to more simple. Okay? The best analogy I have for this is a house. Let's say you've got a beautiful piece of land out in the countryside, and you go out and build a beautiful log cabin, uh, complete with running water, a nice roof over the head, a beautiful chimney, all the things. You will stand back, admire your completed work, and then you leave it for 30 years. Come back to that cabin, does it look pristine like you left it? The wood is rotting, the roof is caving, the chimney is falling down. The natural state of our entire universe is to move from something built to something leveled out. That happens on, on the cosmic scale, it happens when we build things, it happens all the time. I'm in my 30s now, in my 20s, I did not know that you could sleep wrong. The concept of sleeping wrong was not a concept that I understood, but now in my 30s, I have slept wrong. That's a real thing. My body is, is already starting to break itself down, and when I die, my body will break itself down further. It's a fact of the universe. The complexities tend to break down. The exception to that is life. The exception to that is people and plants and all of God's created beings. A plant starts out as a seed, takes in random nutrients from the ground, takes in water from the rain, and takes in sunlight from the top, and it turns into something that has flowers and fruits. It creates more of itself. Life is what builds something. Death is what happens when we stop. So you see the progression of the man who was walking, standing, sitting, dying. The progression of the blessed person is to take in the things of God and to grow. And we're going to see that more clearly 
in, in the next set of verses. But, but think about, let me make sure that you understand this and are taking this with you, right? What is the easier thing to do? To fall into moral chaos or to do the things of the Lord? The natural progression of our hearts is to move further and further from God, deeper and deeper into moral chaos. There's a word, vice, V-I-C-E, which means moral corruptness, right? Sinful actions is the way us church people might say it. Vice is our natural inclination, right? There's a reason that it's almost the same word as vice, V-I-S-E, because it grips us. It takes us with it, right? It's easy to fall into this progression. It is active and difficult to fall out of it. It's a climb out, but a fall in. But the way that the world, the way that your own heart wants to take you is down, okay? Let's go, let's go and look at, at how God illustrates this through the psalmist in the next few verses. I told you those first two were going to take a minute, didn't I? Okay, let's go to verses 3 and 4. Okay, think, think through these things as we read these verses again. Starting in verse 3, he is like a tree planted beside streams of water. This is the blessed person. It's like a tree planted beside streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Do you see? It's, it's a tree. It's taking nutrients. It's taking the water. It's taking the sun and it's producing fruit. And not only is it producing fruit, it's not what? Withering. It produces fruit. In our garden, we have all sorts of things that produce fruit, and then when they're done producing fruit, they just die. This is a strange plant. This is a plant where the leaves don't fall off of it when it's done. This is a plant that doesn't even go into the, the dormant state like our trees do. They don't drop their leaves and go dormant for a while. This, this plant keeps its leaves. This plant keeps producing. It produces fruit in its season, but it doesn't die when its season is done. It's a strange plant, this blessed person. Its leaf does not wither, and all he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. The chaff of the plant is the husk that falls off, the dry pieces that die off. Not the fruit that bears seeds and gives life, but the other parts that fall off of a plant and are destined to be turned into dust or burnt. The blessed person is like this tree. By following, by delighting in what God has, has to offer, the nutrients that God has to offer through his word, through his counsel, the blessed person takes that in and God produces fruit in them. The wicked are not so, but are like the pieces of the plant that fall off already dead and are collected for fire or turn into dust underfoot. There's only two ways. There's only blessed or not blessed. Just to keep extending this tree metaphor, one of my favorite sites, one of our family's favorite sites, when we get to go to the beach, for some reason the beach, the beach trees are not the same as the Tennessee trees. Have you all noticed that? You can start telling when you're getting close to the beach because all of a sudden the trees get what? Skinny, they get tall, right? They, to withstand a storm that's coming, the trees at the beach have to dig strong roots and narrow trunks right? There's a narrow way for them to survive the winds that are coming to them, and that way is to be rooted for the water, rooted for the wind, and narrow in their spread. They don't spread out wide or the wind would take them away. There's a narrow way for them to survive. That way is following in the counsel, right? For us, the analogy is the word is following in the counsel of God, delighting in it, meditating on it, to deepen our roots, to help us to survive the winds and the rains. There's two ways. Okay, so I told you we're moving fast. Now we're going to go to five and six, okay? So we started out talking about people. There's a wicked person, or there's a blessed person. He does this, he doesn't do this, right? Let's talk about plants, right? Now there's the tree and here's the chaff, right? Here's the analogy for you. And the psalmist comes back and reapplies this to people again, okay? Again, verses five and six. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The psalmist says, okay, what do you do with this? Okay, you know that blessedness is a state that you can be in. You know that blessedness is active. It's not your natural inclination. Just like when you're walking for a long time, it's your inclination to stop and then to sit down, right? Blessedness is moving away from our natural inclinations into what God has for us. But what does that mean for us? And what he wants us to see is two things. First, there are temporal 
consequences for us, our choices of blessedness or wickedness, right? There are, there are temporal implications for this, right? That God is saying, as a general truth, when you follow the things of God, your life is better. Now, we can't get into every psalm today, but psalms also accounts for the fact that sometimes it doesn't feel like that. Sometimes it feels like we're striving and moving and trying to do the things of the Lord. We're delighting in God's law. We're trying to follow what he wants for us in our lives, but life is hard. Psalm 73, if you're sitting here hearing what I'm saying and saying, you know what, that's not me. I've tried to do the things of God, and my life has been hard. I've tried to do the things of God, and I'm not bearing fruit. The psalmist deal with that too. Psalm 73, that's your homework. Go and read that. Where the psalmist is dealing with the process, process and the fact that there are people who do wicked things who seem to have it all. And yet he still struggles, right? So these are general truths that can feel at times like they're not true for us, but that doesn't make them less true, right? And again, Psalms, if we had time to go through every Psalm, when we get to Psalm 73, you'll see that, right? You'll see that there are people who, who strive and try and think that, that surely God just doesn't listen to them. The wicked people are blessed. But the truth of that that we can find in Psalm 73 and elsewhere in Scripture is that even though when wicked people seem like they're blessed... They still have to deal with the consequences. So there's a temporal reality to walking in blessedness where, generally speaking, your life will go well for you. God will bless you, probably not in the ways that you expect, probably in harder ways than you ever would have chosen. And on many days, you might look at God and say, I don't feel blessed. But that guy looks blessed. That's the reality of it. But God deals with those things in the internal implications. The judgment that the psalmist is talking about here is talking about the day of final judgment when the, the wicked will not be able to stand up in the presence of the Lord. And there's only one reason that, the, that those of us who are called blessed will, and that's because of what Jesus has done for us. It's not, again, it's not about what you do to be blessed. It's about what God has done to bless you. Okay, so now how do we live this out? What do we do? Okay, three points for you for how we live this out. Are we, are we all together here? The first one, how should we live in light of Psalm 1? The first one is remember the trees. Remember the trees. Okay? Specifically, I'm talking about a tree in Genesis chapter 3. Where mankind first rejected the, wis the wise counsel of God and said, I'll do what's right for me. This sounds good, even though God has said no. I'll do what's right for me. Everything that we live in now is in consequence of that action from Genesis 3. The next time we see, not the, literally the next time we see a tree, but the next tree I want you to call to mind is this tree in Psalm chapter 1. The tree we see in Psalm chapter 1 is a tree that's planted beside the water, that's nourished by the Lord, that bears fruit, that do, doesn't wither. But what is that tree about? That tree is about you. That tree is about someone who has placed their faith in, in Christ, who's placed their faith in God, who loves God for how he's communicated with them, the word that he's given them, and processes those things all the way through. Blessed is that person. There's another picture of a tree in Jeremiah chapter 17 that this psalm and, and, and Jeremiah 17 are, are heavily related. I don't have time to get into all that with you right now. But chap Jeremiah 17 paints an elaborate picture of a tree in a desert place that's dead and bearing no fruit. But when the water of the Lord comes by it, all of a sudden it has life, right? It's because of the water that God has placed beside you that you have life. It's because we live in a day and age where we can carry the water around in our backpack, right, that we can have this abundant life. Jeremiah 17 paints the picture of the tree that's dead and the tree that's alive. And finally, this is all enabled to us by the tree from Mark chapter 15, where Jesus was hanged to a cross for us. Scripture teaches us so clearly that the natural progression of our heart is from walking to standing to sitting. And the only way, the only hope that we have to break that pattern is because of what Jesus has already done for us. It's only because of what Jesus has done for us that we can turn to God and run the race that Christ has set before us. Even when a race, our race feels harder than somebody else's, even when our race doesn't feel fair, we run the race that Christ has set before us because of what Christ has done for us on the tree. The only way that we can access that state of being blessed by God is by what he did for us. So how do we live? First, remember the trees. Second, 
I want to challenge you to meditate actively, right? We're coming back to this, okay? Uh, we're spending the next five, the next four weeks after this week in Psalms. Next week we'll be in Psalm chapter two. Okay, I'm 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 going to give you a piece of concrete homework and a piece of abstract homework. Are y'all okay with that? Here's the concrete one. I want you to practice meditating on the word of the Lord. Next week Matt is preaching on Psalm chapter two. If you found Psalm chapter one, it's the one that comes right after it. Uh, practice what it means to meditate on Psalm chapter two in advance of the sermon next week. And I wonder how God will move in your life and in that sermon. Spend time with that, with that psalm, if you can, every single day to the point where you find yourself thinking about it when you're not reading it. That's, that's when you know you've hit it, okay? When you start thinking about it even though you're not reading it right now. When you're chopping the vegetables for dinner, right? When you're slicing the seven different kinds of pie to make into one giant pie and that psalm comes into your mind, okay, you might be meditating then, okay? So meditate on Psalm chapter 2, bring that to your mind, and see what God does in your life and in your heart next week. And then the more abstract homework is irrigate. Again, I painted that picture from Jeremiah chapter 17, right? This is playing on, pulling from Psalm chapter 1, right, with a tree, with the water beside it. The tree is dead, but then the water comes by it, and now it suddenly has life. Okay, Let's, let's try the mission of the church, the goal of the church, the team that we're going to commission in just a minute from the church. Our goal is to take the water that we have access to. Some of us have whole swim pools in our backyard that we're keeping for ourselves. But the goal of the church is to take that water and bring it to other spaces. We're going to fill up some watering cans and try to find some trees that don't have life and offer some of God's, God's counsel, some of God's water. You can do that in your neighborhood, you can do that in your own home, but take the water that you have and the supply that you have and take it to somebody who needs it. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer and the musicians are going to come and lead us in a, a song of response to the psalmist. Father God, thank you for preserving your word in this way. Thank you for not leaving us without counsel. Thank you for the offering, the promises of your blessedness fulfilled by Jesus. Lord, can we walk in those ways? Would you fill up our cups with water? And would you help us to not be so selfish as to keep those for ourselves, but instead to pour those out where it's needed most? In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.